It is Wednesday afternoon, September 11th, and we are, really, we finished Bear Sheep Genesis last week. I didn't say this is the end, where I maybe should have and said, but really it's the end of the beginning, <laughs> which is what Genesis means, Bear Sheep, the beginning. And as we go into this, we'll just call it an epilogue, but I may also, if I had to give it a title, I might say something about uh, Israel, God's time clock or the plan for Israel throughout time from Bereshit to Revelation. Any of this would be true, and it ties right into the end of Bereshit, to the end of Genesis, because as we looked in closing, we saw that Yosef, Joseph, as he was dying, he believed so fully, so 100% convinced in God's unfolding plan of redemption that would come, and that there is an afterlife, that there is a resurrection, based on that, the, uh, being resurrected to life, uh, a godly, a, a life in God's presence because of the coming redemption. This being his belief, he knew that God had promised Messiah coming to Israel. And so he didn't want his bones left in Egypt. And he made his family promise to carry his bones up the same way he took his father's bones, Yaakov, Jacob, back to, Egypt, back to Israel. He knew there would be a time coming when Israel would be brought out of Egypt. If he knew from earlier, he knew it would be 400 years, he knew it would be a long time. But he made them promise, when you go, not if you go, when you go, you take my bones with you. So this book concludes with a look toward God's eternal plan, God's loving plan, God's wise plan, and the fact that God had a plan for his people Israel, for the nation of Israel, that even going down into Egypt was part of God's plan. Because if you remember, they went down small in number. They were only 70. If they stayed in the land, they probably would have died off in the famine. If they did not die off in the famine, they would have continued into assimilation with the nations around them that were ungodly. So God said, I've got to protect my little family. I'm going to take my family down to Egypt where I will feed them. But more importantly, they're going to be kept segregated because Egyptians didn't like shepherds. They thought that was abhorrent. And our people were shepherds and, and those that, that worked the land. So they were put into the land of Goshen, a very fertile, a very good place for their flocks to, to flourish. At the same time, a very good place for a family of 70 to flourish. So that they turn mm -hmm. into two and a half million people by the time we get to 400 years later. And God said, because I'm keeping you separate, segregated, you're not going to be marrying the Egyptians. They're not going to be marrying you. And in that intermarriage is what would take place but the assimilation of other gods, of other ways of worship. With that cut off, you're going to be just focusing here. You're going to grow in the truth of the one true and living God, the God of Israel. So this was God's way of providing for his little family because God gave a plan through this family before they're called Israel. He said, through you will come this one who will redeem, that Yosef put his faith in. Through you will come the one we call Messiah, the one who will be our savior. And it'll come through Avraham, through your promised son. It'll come through Isaac, the promised son, through his son, Yaakov. He made the promise of the land physically, the, the geographic, I should say, the geographic land to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then it was to continue on through Jacob's seed. And we know it specifically for Messiah would come through the line of Judah, Judah, that would carry the kingly, the royal line. And we know it goes through David, David, the, the king um, that God raised up in Israel. We know that it continued on all the way to Messiah's birth. We can follow that genealogical timeline and see that Yeshua's uh, ancestry could be proven all the way back. Every line, every family where it had to be. So God had made that promise. But we see Israel become a people that didn't always remember her God didn't always follow her God. We saw that even in our patriarchs. We saw their ups and their downs. The scripture tells it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It doesn't color it. It's not stories. 
It's true life what happened. Mm -hmm. And so God gave it in, in all in the way that it is. And we see there were times when they didn't remember their God and he had to allow consequences into their circumstances to wake them up and bring them back to their God. We even had a, um, I'll just say in this way, a beloved rabbi to, to myself and, and one other in our group that is not yet a believer in Mashiach even say, October 7th tragedy. It, where was God? And he starts telling the miracle stories where God kept his hand. And he even admitted, you know, with our consequences to us not being right with God. This is what is, is happening. In our world today, I hear so many times when people say, Lord, why am I going through this? You know, I, I'm a Christian. This shouldn't happen to me. Really? Where in our scriptures does God say that when you're called by his name, you have no trials? You have no tribulations? To the contrary. He says, I'll be with you. I will bring you through. I will protect you. I will uphold you with my righteous right arm. He promises to bring through. The same way with Israel. He promised to be unconditionally faithful to Israel. And he has done exactly that for 4,000 plus years. If you want to take it back to before their nation, go all the way back. He has always remained faithful. When the people have it, there are consequences. But even in those consequences, he is faithful. So as we move through this timeline with Israel, we're going to see that there is never a time when God said, if you do or you don't, I'll cut you off. He never promises that to Israel. To the contrary, he even says, you know, when you are ornery, when you're disobedient, when you've forgotten me, when I have to take you out into captivity, I will bring you back. The promise is always, always there. So even though we find our family of Israel in Egypt at the end of our book, it really is the end of just the beginning. And we're going to see that God has this timeline and he works with Israel all the way through and you can bring it all the way to 2024 and you can bring it for however long time goes beyond us also. I'm going to focus back though and give you a bit of that timeline. Let me remind you in our study bear sheet, in the beginning, back in chapter one, a whopping three years ago about, <laughs> we studied and looked and we saw that in verse 14 of chapter one, God said there are times and there are seasons and that he has reasons for them. Ma'ad in my Hebrew, that there is, there's a purpose behind it. We see that, to give you a quick and easy example in chapter 17, verse 21, God said to Sarah, Sarah, you will bear a son it at the appointed time. God has the timeline. He is above time. He's not held by time. He sees time complete where we see it in pieces, past, present, future. He's above it and beyond it on both sides of the, that eternal past and eternal future, yet he chooses to work in our time and he has set appointed times. In chapter 18, it followed through. Verse 14 said, At the appointed time, I will return. And we know that Yitzhak, Isaac, was born, the son of promise, the one who was born to a 90-year-old woman, a 100-year-old man, because God said, I will bring this one about. It wasn't what Abraham did on his own, but it's what God did, because is there anything too hard for God? This God who created this world out of nothing, he couldn't impregnate Sarah. He couldn't bring Abraham back to life to plant seed in the womb and enable her to carry and to deliver this promised child? Of course not. That's, there's nothing too hard for our God, and that's exactly what happened. As we moved through that time, we saw that Yaakov, Jacob, lived in Egypt for 17 years. He was 147 years old at the end when he made his son promise to carry his bones back into Israel to the land of promise. But he blessed his 12 sons before his, his death in his final, um, final days of life, I'll put it that way. And he passed over his own two sons, first place and second place, and went all the way down to Yosef, the firstborn of Rachel, Rachel, to give him that continued promise. This wasn't the natural order, but we see God step into it 
and that he has that plan and that time. And in that great prophecy that he gave where he brought Yosef up into that position, we also have what's called the, the Achari Hayamim, the end of days. We have a prophecy that carries all the way through, through excuse me, to the end of the days. So that as we look today in end days, and they're not quite over yet, but we're closer to the end than we were back in, in this time in, in Egypt where uh, I'm going to say they came out of Egypt roughly 1445 B.C. So let's just say we're around 18, 1900 B.C. Now we're at 2400 A.D. You do the math. We've got thousands of years that this prophecy has been unfolding. Now the amazing thing for me, if you gave me nothing else but prophecy with the Word of God, is that it's exact. It is perfect. It never misses. I don't need any more to prove to me than this whole Bible is true. Yeah. It's, if it can do that, I can trust it in all points and all ways. Exactly. And every way anyone tries to attack this, this book, I'll say reverently, they fall short. Archaeology proves it. History proves it. Mathematically is proven. Scientifically is proven. Yeah. No one has been able to disqualify the living word of the living God. So as we look at this prophecy and see, I can't prophesy next week and make it happen. How could Yaakov, Jacob, prophesy thousands of years and make it happen? But that's our God because he planned it and it's unfolding. He has to laugh when man makes plans because if it's not in his plan, it's not how it's going to unfold. But here is our God. And here is the faithfulness of Yaakov. We saw it in his son Yosef also, both believing. God has promised Israel. He has promised the people, the land, specific promises. And he's going to fulfill all of those promises. So we see in the Tanakh, and that means in your, what you call Old Testament, I'll call original covenant, because I don't want you to think old as an antiquated. So think of it as the original, what was given first. God is going to point to them time, time, time. He's going to teach and talk to them all about time. Let me give you an example. It's very well known. Ecclesiastes. If you look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, it tells you to everything there's a time. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to be joyful, a time to be mournful. It's every aspect looking at it all. God has told them there is time. I've already brought out to you in the very first chapter of our Bible, God said times and seasons, and he has planted so much in that that, that was even prophetic in what it was looking at that we studied when we were back in those scriptures in detail. In Tehillim Psalm chapter 41 and verse 1, God promises, I'll deliver you in time of trouble. He didn't say you'll have no trouble. He said, I'll deliver you in time of trouble. Now, I'm going to tell you to keep in context. We can take and we can apply scriptures to ourselves. But when that was written, that's in the book of Psalms, written by David, David, who lived about approximately 1,000 B.C., just approximate numbers there, then who is God saying, I'll deliver you from trouble? He's speaking to David and probably to David's people, who just happened to be who we call Israel. So these are promises God was saying to Israel, you're going to have trouble. I'm going to bring you through the trouble. Now again, we can take and apply that to us today, and we do. Not a thing wrong with that. Just don't take it away from Israel. Give it to the, the rightful original owners of it also, if I can say that. Look with me at Psalm, Tehillim Psalm 89. And we'll look at verses 46 and 47. Psalm 89, 46 and 47. And we have, How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? Remember what my span of life is, for what vanity you've created all the sons of men. In other words, God, remember, I'm just a man. I just have a short lifespan. How long are we going to have to endure this? Couldn't we say those words today? <laughs> have some of us been guilty of those words in our mouths today? But yet, it's the psalmist crying out with what his people are going through, the nation of Israel. 
Look at Psalm 56 since you're there. Tehillim in Hebrew, Psalm 56, and look at verse 3. Another one again, so, so timeless. So good for then, so good for now. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. Amen. That's what we're to do in the midst of our fears, in the midst of our worries. We find him that he's trustworthy. If he were to turn his back on Israel after saying he would never, then I would not trust him now in my trouble to not turn his back on me also. But that is not what God does. And when you have trials and tribulations, when you have atrocities, when you have bad things happen, it is not saying that God's not looking at you or God's not protecting you or God's not able. Remember, there's nothing too hard for the Lord. We need to see it from His view. It's either a correction from Him or it is still a consequence of the sin that this world brings on itself and He's going to bring us through. And in that, it doesn't get lost on us. It grows us into conforming into His image. It draws us closer to Him. Because what do we see happen with Israel? When she gets out of fellowship with the Lord, it's those hard places, those hurts, those times of trouble that bring her back. That's what happens with us spiritually too. So God works in both the good and the evil for His purposes, and He has that perfect timing. And when He spoke it to Israel and told them, I've got a time and I've got a plan, and it is a master plan. That's part of my words. Galatians 4.4. 4. Master mind, master God, and master plan. Galatians 4.4. 4. And anybody wants to say amen, they can. <laughs> yes. Okay. Galatians 4.4. 4. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. That's not the verse I was after. I want in the fullness of time. I wrote down the wrong reference. Wonderful. God said, you know, that he would come in the fullness of time. Um, someone want to help me find that verse real quick? My mind is spinning. It's a very well-known verse. Um, and I am in the right place. I wrote it down. Oh, oh no, no, no. I did read the wrong verse. It is Galatians 4.4. 4. Sorry. I just read, I read 5 instead of 4 or 6 or whatever. Anyway. But when the fullness of the time came, when that time was completed, that God said, okay, this is the time it's going to happen. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. That's Yeshua, Jesus. He sent forth his son, born of a woman, Miriam, Mary in your English, born, um, under, born of a woman, born under the law. When Yeshua came into human form, Yeshua, divine son of God, very God himself, never born, eternity. In the beginning was a word. Word was with God. The word was God. So we're not talking about the God part of Yeshua. We're talking about his human flesh. He's saying here in Galatians, it was in the fullness of time. It was exactly when God said. In other words, Yeshua wasn't going to come a day earlier, a year earlier, a century earlier, nor time. later. Yes, he is exactly on time. And if I had time, if I could just teach this endless, I'd go into all kinds of prophecies that showed it had to be in certain circumstances, in certain ways, and it had to be he had to be born in Bethlehem, Beit Lechem. His mama's pregnant, nine months pregnant, living in Nazareth. They didn't have airplanes. They didn't have Rolls Royces. They didn't have a good form of transportation for a nine-month pregnant woman. She's going to use her feet and at best maybe be on a donkey. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. She doesn't give birth all the way during the time it took them a good couple of weeks to get to Beit Lechem. But as soon as they're there, and they're there by a Gentile decree, interesting, mm -hmm. first time decree that they had to go back to where the family came from to be registered and taxed. And she doesn't give birth till she gets there. And then she doesn't give birth a week later. She gives birth right when she gets there. So he's born in Beit Lechem, where Micah, Micah, chapter 5 and verse 2, said he'd be born. And that prophecy is six, 700 years before he was born. Yeah. That's prophecy. That's my God. That's yeah, his timing. God, especially if he can keep her from bump and bump and keep her that. Yeah. That's gone all the way around. Yeah, absolutely. Didn't come early. No pain. Didn't no come late. late. But she got there. <laughs> she got there. I don't know if it was in pain or not, but That's she not got cool. there. 
look then now with that in mind at Romans 5 and verse 6. Romans 5 and verse 6, where we read in there, For while we were still helpless, while we're still in our sins, at the right time, Mashiach, Messiah, Christ died for the ungodly. God didn't say, when you get to a good point, when you've earned it, when you've worked it up, when you're there, then. No, he died for us when we couldn't do anything for ourselves. We'll take that and apply that to Israel. He never told Israel, when you get enough brownie points with me, when you're obedient long enough, when you do this right, when you look the right direction. No, he said, I will be faithful to you. I'll bring you back. But God does not allow anyone or a nation to, to, to separate his plan from happening. You can't undo what God has said. You can't. I don't care who you are, and I don't care how many you are. What God has said, it will be in his perfect timing. Let that encourage you also. Romans 8, since we're right here, go to Romans 8 and verse 18. Let's get a little encouragement in here for you. And verse 18. Well, that's coming also. <laughs> for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So God's saying, you are having these hard times. I do know you're suffering. But when you get through my plan and into the glory, this is nothing compared to that. This, this, you, you won't even remember I, hardly, you know, only remember in the way to glorify the Lord is all. But that's the encouragement. This is temporary, and this is nothing compared to what he has waiting for us. Then you go to verse 28, where God says he's working it all together for your good. He's not saying, uh-oh, I got a problem. Hang on, I'll get you through it. I'll figure it out. No, he's saying, I'm even using these circumstances. I'm working it together for your good. For those who are called by my name, according to my purpose. Then go to the end of Romans to 38 and 39 that nothing can separate you from the love of God. And the next time you want to say on your lips, Lord, how come or why or question and think that he's not being good to you, which is the connotation that's there. I want to say zip your lips and, and say, oh Lord God, let me see this from your view. Let me see how even this is for my good because that's who you are and what you say in my life. And we're told in Galatians 6, 9 that we will reap if we don't faint. So hang in there, keep sowing, and you will reap. That verse? Uh, that's Galatians 6, 9. That's another good verse. Many, many more verses. But as I have to move on in our theme, I want you to see now, looking at how God uses time, uses the good and the bad for his glory and for his perfect plan. Now we're going to see also that the Lord has promised Israel. He's got a time clock with Israel also. Go with me to Yeshahu, Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60, and we'll look at verse 22. Isaiah 60 and verse 22. And in Isaiah 60 and verse 22, he's, being, he's telling Israel what it will be like. The smallest mm -hmm. one will become a clan. That's a large number. When you've got a clan, you've got a big family. The least one becomes a mighty nation. Israel was the least. She was the runt of the litter, the least likely. God didn't choose her because she was all that and something else too. He chose her so that his glory would be what would shine. When you see somebody little and tiny able to do something mighty and majestic, you know, wow, that's beyond them. Then that's their God. That was his purpose. But notice the next phrase, I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. I'm going to make it come quickly when it's the right time for you to grow exponentially that way, for you to come into that glory that will come with it. And he tells them they need to seek him. Go with me to Hosea, Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. And in that verse we read, Sow with a view to righteousness, reap in accordance with kindness, break up your foul ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes to rain righteousness on you. That goes along with Galatians, what I read. If you are, are doing what it's saying here, if you're sowing 
and you're, you're wanting to reap, you're breaking up the ground, you're getting it ready, you're planting your seeds, you're going to, to maybe fertilize the soil, you're going to cover it up, and you're going to water it. And God's saying, guess what? I'm going to water it. I'm going to rain righteousness. That's beautiful. What that would grow, if he rains, if it's the waters of righteousness, the plants that would grow, and that's what he's promising <clears throat> Israel, you will spring forth in this kind of abundance. But it's in time. When you plant, you don't get it in one day. In fact, it looks as if it's died. You can't even see the seed you planted. And in essence, that seed dies in the ground. It germinates there. But then new life springs forth. So God's promising Israel, I have this time. Seek it with me. Plan with me and realize I have a specific plan. I have it for the nation of Israel, a specific people in a specific geographic location. We often take and spiritualize verses. Again, it's okay to apply, but leave it for who it belongs to also. Don't take it away from them. So when we see that God's speaking in regard to end time events, we need to leave those end time events in context. And it's a hard, what? Not lesson, it's a hard concept for we of the called out assembly, the church body, to realize we weren't there when God was giving these verses to Israel. The body of Messiah, the called out assembly, the church, doesn't start until Acts chapter 2. Doesn't start until the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, came and indwelt the Talmudim, who just happened to be Jewish, by the way, but indwelt them after Yeshua had died, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. He said the Holy Spirit wouldn't come until he went. Then he starts his new program, not at the exclusion of the Jew, thank God I'm one here that believes and is in the body of Messiah, but his plan with the nation mm -hmm. was set aside because he said, you won't accept me. They denied the Messiah, yes. and they kept denying to the point that they even see to Stephen stoning. And at that point, that's when God says, okay, I'm going to raise up another people. I'm going to get them to take your place. Israel, you're gone. Forget you. Not coming back to you. Changing my mind. No, Forget everything no, I said. No, no, no. <laughs> Good for the nose. No. no, he says, I'm going to provoke you to jealousy. I'm going to make you want it. You're going to say, wait a minute, it was mine first. And God's going to say, Good. Now it's for both. And that's what he does. The grafting in that we see in Romans chapter 11 in particular, he brings back in the original branches that he's moved or some broken off to make room for this beloved. The family that Yeshua said, I have sheep of another pasture that you don't even know about. They didn't know. They didn't have a clue. But when you're looking at Israel's scriptures, you have to look at the view without the church because they're not there. They don't know about the church. They couldn't know about the church because it's not been born yet. I can't know about somebody's baby that's coming way down the line. So you have to remember that. And when you do, then you realize, okay, then Yeshua, in the Gospels, when he's speaking to Israel, speaking to individuals, whichever way it is, speaking to the crowds, he's not speaking to the church. And I think that's our biggest way that we get into trouble and into confusion, is we jump and put ourselves in there. Now again, can we draw a spiritual lesson? Absolutely. Can we learn to apply something? Yes, but we have to leave it where it is. So when he's talking to them about time, he's not talking to them about time for the church. He's talking to them about time for the nation of Israel. So if I asked you what time is it in relation to Israel, it would be a far different answer than if I asked you what time is it for the church. Okay, for the called out assembly, we believe our time is ticking to an end, that we're close to being raptured. Okay, and I won't argue which view today, but you all know my view. If you don't go to my website, you can find it or get a hold of me and I'll let you know. I'm not ashamed of it, I just don't want to get sidetracked by it. To Israel, 
the time clock is not for her to be raptured. Israel is not going to be raptured. Israel remains on this land, on this earth, I'm sorry, because she's a geographic location. And there are promises God made to an earthly people in an earthly location that he is going to fulfill. So when he says, to give you an example, I'm going to sit on the throne of David, he's going to sit on the throne of David. Now where's the throne of David? Is it in heaven? No. Throne in heaven? That's Jehovah's and Yeshua's. Love seat built for two. I love it. That's the throne in heaven. The throne on earth in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, comma, Israel, not occupied territory. Get off my soapbox. In Israel, that's where the throne's going to be occupied by Mashiach, by Messiah, who is going to come establish his kingdom. The whole earth is going to come up to his kingdom to be blessed, and they're going to have a thousand years of shalom on earth. We're going to have an eternity of shalom in heaven. We're going to have different things that are promised to us. This is what's promised to Israel. There's a doomsday clock out. I don't know if you're all familiar with the doomsday clock. It's approaching midnight. The hands are the closest to midnight that they've ever been. They were put there in the year 2023 and they were not moved in the year 2024. At January 1st, when we're turning to the new year, they look at the, the clock, they look at what's going on, and they make their decision about how close to doomsday they should be. Midnight's doomsday. Midnight's when something is going to happen. They're thinking it'll be the atomic um, nuclear wet war, you know, whatever. That's what they're looking at. Let me explain to you, let me go back a little bit, okay? This, this clock was created by Einstein and Oppenheimer and the other scientists that were working on the top secret nuclear weapons called the Manhattan Project. There was a movie out recently, I haven't seen it, but we're talking about that era. At that time, two atomic bombs were dropped on Japan. It changed all kinds of things. So they put out what they called a bulletin in 1954 in Chicago, I'm sorry, 1945 in Chicago. Two years later, 1947, they introduced the Doomsday Clock. And these Nobel uh, laureate scientists, they're, they're, they're called atomic scientists, they announce where the hands are supposed to be. They make the decision. And they make the decision, that there's a whole board, that it's called the Atomic Scientist Science and Security Board, just so you know I'm not making things up. It's made up of a board of sponsors that has nine Nobel laureates, and they decide, like in 23 and 24, with Russia's nuclear arsenal, with Israel's war on Gaza, with our climate changes, we're as close to that doomsday as we've ever been. So that's their clock. That's what they're saying. They've got it about 90 seconds from the apocalypse, okay? 90 seconds to that midnight to when something's going to happen. But if you ask me, that's man's time clock, okay? What is God's time clock? Tick-tock, God's clock. That's the clock I care about. That's the clock I want to know. And when I look at how can I see God's time in the Word of God, I notice one thing very interesting. It's always in relation to Israel. The nation of Israel, you will see tick tock, God's clock. So we're going to study, we're going to give an overview, we're going to go from Bereshit to Revelation, but when we get to our study in the book of Daniel, which will be coming soon, <laughs> depends on how long we take in between, we're going to get into a huge time clock, a huge prophecy. Prophecy that covers the greatest period of time, but we're going to see how exacting it is. It is amazing. We're going to see the time clock in Daniel's 70th week, or 70 weeks, let me say that, but the 70th week in particular. We're going to study it in detail. So I'm not here to give you detail. I'm here to give you that overall. So we've seen, we've set, we've established that God has a time clock that is ticking in relation to Israel. If it's in the past, that's past. That doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It just means, you know, I can say, you know, we're past September 10th. That was yesterday. Okay, but I'm also going to tell you there's time today. 
and there's time future. When we look at time future, we're looking at prophecy. We're looking at it as what is coming yet to be fulfilled. God looks at it slightly differently. It's called proleptically. Big word, easy to understand because it just simply means he looks at the future as done. It's already happened in God's book. Because remember, he sees and knows it all. He planned it all. He doesn't just see and know. He planned it all. The best way to describe it is go to the rose parade. Sit down on the curb or in the bleachers. You're waiting for the parade to start. Then you see it. That's present. And then pretty soon it's past you. That's past now. But it's still future for those a mile down the road from you. They're still waiting for it to start. Then it's their present. Then it's their past. And it goes on. God doesn't see it in those little increments because God's over it all. He's like the helicopter view that's looking down and says, here's the beginning and here's the end and I can see before it and I can see after it. And he's over all of that. But he's going to give us prophecy. He's going to give it to us as done. And the fact that we've had so much prophecy to this day, fulfilled exactly, done in God's timing perfectly, the time of Yeshua's birth, everything more than what I've already said, then I have no fear, no qualm to say what he's saying is coming will be fulfilled exactly in that perfect timing too. So doomsday clock, throw it out the window. Give me God's clock, tick tock and God's clock. And we'll see that in relation to the nation of Israel, God identifies himself over 342 times in scripture. And if he's going to refer to himself in this way once, I'm listening. Twice he's got my attention. 342 times? Hello. I don't think we need a board to hit us in the head to see. He calls himself the God of Israel. He says he's the Holy One of Israel. He says he's the Lord God of Israel. But he refers to himself with this time again and again and again. He reveals himself to Israel as Yehovah. Yahweh as that holy name that, that we don't even know the correct pronunciation because he's above and beyond our mind, but he shows us a very special love. I love this part because God could be so big, the, the creator of, of the universes of the universes, and, and he could be so magnanimous, and he is, that we could think, how could he relate to this little of dust that's alive right now and will be dead in a few years one way or another. But God, in his love, stepped in. He stepped in very personal into the human race to redeem the human race. And he chose a specific people to represent him. And that's why he has that specific plan. It was a plan of redemption for all time, for all mankind. It was not a plan to redeem Israel only and, oops, what am I going to do with the Gentiles? Oh, maybe I better love them too? No, no, never. God's plan was to use that little insignificant group of people to show the whole world his love. And that's still what's in the process of happening. So as God is working, he is developing his plan with no exceptions, with no plan B's, with no derailments, he is continuing it on. It is the plan of redemption, and it's important to see that. How were people redeemed before Yeshua came? How are people redeemed today? How are people redeemed in the future? What about when you walk away from God? The consequences are there. We see the suffering that comes from that. But never does God say, oh, I've got another way to redeem you then. Never does God say there's a dual way. One way for the Jew to get saved, one way for the Gentile to get saved. Never, ever says that. And he never says, I'm going to replace you, Israel. He promised forever to Israel. That's important because he made other promises forever to the church, to the called out assembly. If he's going to waffle over here, I'm going to count on him waffling over here. If he's solid here, I can bank on him being solid here. 
So when he says in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3, I have loved you, and he's speaking to Israel through the Jewish prophet Jeremiah before there's a church family. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That means that he loves them through Babylonian captivity. He loves them through the exile we're in today. He loves them in their in in out in the exile. He's not saying only when you're in the land and only when you're right. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 18, the very beginning of it says, O hope of Israel, its Savior in time of distress. So when I refer to the hope of Israel, I'm referring to the Savior of Israel. I'm referring to Messiah. When I stand side by side with a Jewish not yet believer in Messiah, we are both looking for the same Messiah to come. I just happen to believe he came once, dealt with the sin issue, and will come a second time to rule and reign. And they're looking for that ruling, reigning one, so they didn't accept the suffering one, but they should have because their own scripture said it. But God never said, because you missed it here, you're out. No. Lamentations 3, verses 21 through 26 says to have hope. Remember the hope is the hope of Israel. The hope is Messiah. Have hope. There's new mercies every morning. Salvation is coming. That's what these verses here mean. And that just happened to be spoken to people going into captivity. Not to people who are right with their God. But to people who are so far off He's got to do something major to get them back on track. Hosea, Hosea chapter 2 and verse 23. Hosea has a very unfaithful wife. God told Hosea again and again and again, take her back, take her back, take her back. She'd come back in, she'd go off, unfaithful to him again, bring him back. Why did God tell Hosea to keep bringing her back? Because God's saying, this is, you're representing me. Your wife is representing Israel. Every time she goes off, I'm going to bring her back. I'm going to bring her back. Not to give her the right to go, but to show I am faithful. That's why he says, I will sow her for myself in the land. I will also have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. She didn't earn his compassion. I will say to those who were not my people, when they're out there doing their own thing, they're not his people. That I will say you are my people because he's saying I will bring you back you are mine I will be your God and he makes that clear again and again and again so his promise is unconditional all the way through Israel's time but he does require obedience in 1st Samuel 1st Shmuel chapter 15 verse 22 he tells them obedience is even better than sacrifice he had given them the sacrifices they were to make. And the importance of it is because the sacrifices of those lambs pointed to the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. And they had to put their, their show their faith in the Lamb of God by, by making the animal sacrifices. So when God says obedience is even more important, he's saying it's not just an outward sign. It's a heart that's right with me. You have to be obedient. You have to follow my ways. You have to follow my commandments. And in, in Davarim, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says that they're to keep all the commandments that God commanded. You're all familiar with 10. By the time the Jewish people get done going through the scriptures, what, what God told Moshe for the people, how they're to live, all those rules and regulations, they have made for themselves 613 commandments. It's not just the 10. The 10 are kind of like categories overall, but there's 613 that God's saying you need to be obedient to. In verses 6 through 8 of Deuteronomy 4, 1 and 2 commands them to keep them. Then he says there's wisdom and there's understanding. In fact, let's read it. Let's look at it. Instead of me summarizing this, it'll make it clearer. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Okay, one and two while you're getting there. Now, Israel, listen to the statutes, the judgments, which I'm teaching you to perform so you may live and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord your God, your fathers, is giving you. 
You shall, you shall not add the word which I'm commanding. Sorry, you shall not add to the word which I'm commanding, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. So he's setting down laws. You need to be obedient to these laws as you go in to possess the land. I promise you, don't add to them, don't take away from them. Those are very important words also. But then look at verse 6. So keep them and do them, for that's your wisdom. That's your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statues and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and an understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God whenever we call on him? Or what great nation is there that has status and statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I'm setting before you today? What God was saying in that is I'm not giving you rules and regulations to rule and regulate your life to death, to make you miserable, to make you, you can't step out of line, you can't, here's the line, don't cross your big toe over that. That wasn't his point. But in showing them what he wanted of them, blessing them in their obedience, being there for them, the rest of the world would see, wow, their God cares for them. Their God has a relationship with them. Our God, what's our God doing? It can't hear, it can't talk. It's just an inanimate object. I want their God. Their God hears them. Their God talks with them. Their God guides them. Their God helps them. Their God is an awesome God. That was the purpose. Sadly, they go astray, both the, the Jewish and the Gentile worlds. But he's saying, because I am right there, I'm right there with you. You have no excuse not have a relationship with me. You need to be obedient to me. And that's why in verse 23, he tells them, don't forget. And I'll go down to verse 23 and read it for you. Is that in Deuteronomy In Deuteronomy 4, same chapter that we're in. Uh, 23. 23. So watch yourselves that you do not forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. And make for yourselves a graven image in the form of anything against which the Lord your God has commanded you. Remember how he said no other graven images? Remember he's separating this people. He's separating them from a world of idolatry. They worshipped everything. They worshipped the sun god. They worshipped the earth god. They worshipped the tree god. They worshipped the god that was the god of the flies. They worshipped the god of, of the river. They worshipped, you name it, they worshipped it. And God's saying, I'm the true God. I'm the one in relationship to you. Don't walk away. Don't go off to these other gods. Yes, Rhonda. Can you unmute Rhonda, Roger? Almost. There we go. Okay. I I know you go I know you do Sabbath, right? Um, as a Messianic Jew. But if you don't do Sabbath and the feast and all that is, are you out of line? Can you behave like a Gentile? <laughs> Can I behave like a Gentile? It's a good question. I mean, in, in a short are you still form. Good? I, I know we're under grace, but can you be like a Gentile and not do Sabbath and not do. In the short, in the short answer, because this has a lot of. It, I could go off for hours on it. In a short form. I am not under the law to have to keep Shabbat as under the law. If so, I could not drive my car, I could not use my stove, I could not even turn on lights. You know, there's all that goes into keeping the Shabbat. They were to do nothing, and they weren't to have any servants working for them, so that's why you can't use other things. That's under law. But did God give the sign of the Sabbath to the Jewish nation that he is their God entering into a special relationship with them? And on every Shabbat there to remember he's the creator of the world yeah. and he's the God that brought them out of Egypt. Yes, that I need to perpetually keep. When I keep Shabbat, I don't keep it as under law. I keep it as that remembrance, setting aside a time with my God on the day that God commanded to the Jewish people so that I can invite other Jewish people, come into my Shabbat, come and let's remember our God. Let's remember the God who created it all, the God who created us, the God who brought us out of Egypt. What's that God doing with us today? Is he still in that kind of relationship with us today? And no matter what scriptures we're studying as a Jewish family around the world, 
I can show them Messiah in those scriptures because he's in every single scripture. So I can keep my Shabbat as a Jewish believer because I don't have to walk away from my ethnicity and my nationality and my culture, but I'm also seeing it in its spiritual. I see it on every level and I'm able to keep it and embrace it and be a part of it in a way under grace. Amen. So I think it's something beautiful to do. Paul says, if you can honor any day to the Lord, honor that day. I can also, just so you all understand, I can walk into a church on a Sunday and worship my God yeah. Yeah. and celebrate the fact that they're looking at Sunday as the day they believe that Yeshua raised from the dead. I'll tell you he raised before sunrise. So uh, when you look at the Jewish day, he raised in the evening, but it was at the beginning of the day. Not here to slice and dice and not here to divide. But I recognize that my Messiah raised from the dead. I recognize he's doing a new thing with this body of believers called the church. And I can have a wonderful time honoring and worshiping my God on a Sunday also. But if I want to bring my Jewish people in, I'll be very honest. Forgive me. I just... This is Israeli. Israelis just speak it, okay? Yeah. <laughs> there are too many churches today that are Gentile-minded only. There are too many churches today that speak against Israel, that speak replacement theology, that say God's done with Israel, mm -hmm. and that take all her blessings to themselves, and they don't bother with the curses. They just take the blessings. But too many times in that setting... And I had the experience, so I'm talking personal, having an, a not-yet-believing Jewish person with me in a service that bashed Israel, bashed, bashed the Jewish people. What they just did in my witness to that one, trying to bring them to the same knowledge of our Lord Yeshua Jesus, our Messiah and Savior, I had to undo damage to be able to get them to begin to listen again. I had to let them know I'm not a part of that. I don't believe that. God didn't say that that way. You know, I, I disagree with them. So I'm going to be a little more hesitant to bring a Jewish not yet believer into a church setting. Plus, they're not looking to go on a Sunday. That's not their day, and they know it. Even the secular Jew knows if I'm going to worship my God, I'm supposed to do it Friday night to Saturday night. That's, that's my day. So I'm going to bring them to a Shabbat service. I'm going to bring them to a Messianic service. I don't want to bring them just to the synagogue that's going to, to be full of, of fluff and worldly things and, and a little bit of scripture or whatever. I want to bring them where they're going to hear the full, complete picture. But I'm going to bring them to a Saturday service. So for that very reason, in Jewish missionary work, I am thrilled that I can offer in my own home a Shabbat service to come to on a Saturday. And we worship the very same God that you go into your church building and worship on Sunday. We worship the God of Israel. The difference is, in a Messianic group, we show how we come to the Father, as Yeshua said, through the Son. And we bring out that in every one of our services. We bring out clearly who Messiah is. We bring out the blend or the completion of the picture. That's why I say when a Jewish person comes to faith, they complete their faith. They don't convert because they're not turning away. A Muslim needs to convert. They need to turn away from worshiping an idol, a false god, and they need to turn to the true god. But the Jew is already worshiping the true god. He doesn't turn away. He goes on in that faith to complete the whole picture. So I'm going to bring my Jewish people into something that hopefully they're going to hear and see and be drawn. And when they realize, hey, they're doing Jewish stuff just like I do, then I don't have to quit being Jewish when I accept this. This isn't the Gentile God. No, no, God doesn't have Gentile and Jewish. And his son that he sent into, human, into the human race did come into the human race in Jewish blood. He is Jewish. I get to embrace it. I get to complete that. So for a Jewish person today, because God said it is a perpetual sign with a Jew, I think it's important that they recognize their Shabbat in one way or another. They don't have to go to a service. They don't have to not use anything for 24 hours and worry about all the stipulations of the law. But I think it's very important for a Jewish person to stop on Shabbat and say, you created 
You created everything. You created yeah. me. And thankfully you created me because you wanted to have an intimate relationship with me. And I see how you kept your hand on my people. You are so faithful, God. If I'm struggling with something, I'm concerned about something, believe me, when I start focusing on my Jewish history, how God took care of this need, he split the Red Sea. He drowned the Egyptian army in the same sea he split. He got two and a half million people across on dry ground, not wet, muddy, soggy ground. He got them across on dry ground. It had to be probably close to somewhere between two and five miles wide to get those people across in one night. He gets every single one of them across, every single one. And the Egyptian army, okay, we can follow, and here they come. And the next thing you know is the waters come down, and they're drowned, and our people on the other side without losing one soul. And the Egyptian army is never seen again. Not the new ones, those. That tells me, wow, my God entered into their circumstances, split a sea, drowned an army. My God, there is nothing you can't do. You created this world out of nothing, and in my faith grows so much as I start focusing on my God. And I do that especially in a Shabbat service, on the Shabbat, as I know this is a commandment to me to always remember. Now, is that something that you as Gentiles can embrace? Absolutely. Are you required? No. God never says through Shaul Paul, who gives the church its marching orders, never says, you have to. Remember he said, pick a day, honor the day. If you want to come, you absolutely should be free to come. Come as a Gentile. Don't come trying to make yourself Jewish because you can't change your spots. And Jewish person, don't come and try to make yourself a Gentile because you can't change your spots. But both be glad for who you made us because you made both in your image. You made both equal. You made both the one race called the human race. Come together, fellowship and love and praise. Can I pose the thought that in the New Testament when Jesus did the Passover and his new covenant to the communion, that he changed it to our communion time is that time of remembering God and Jesus and you guys have the Shabbat every Friday. Anytime we take communion, which we can take anytime mm -hmm. that we fellowship with others and worship, mm -hmm. we are to remember him and his blood and who God is. Absolutely. That's to remember the sacrificial work. The same way the sacrifices are looking forward looked, that looks back and looks absolutely. Um, the, the only thing I'd add on to it, for me, the richness of it, when I'm in a church celebrating communion, is I see and remember this came right out of the Passover Seder. This was my heritage. This was the Lord bringing the new covenant that he promised in Jeremiah 31, and we will, we will get there. We're not going to finish the study today, but we're not here to rip right. We're here to, to get it in, in detail. And I've given you so much background today, we'll move faster through Scripture, and I can get you that outline I was going to have to put up on the whiteboard, so that'll be good too. But as long as you do remember your communion came out of this Jewish ceremony, why is that important? Because then you see the roots of the church are Jewish. Now you're no longer fighting each other. You're seeing Judeo, bud, Christianity, flower. You're seeing how it comes together. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would encourage is, yes, absolutely, it's to remember the shed blood of Yeshua mm -hmm. Jesus. That's exactly what it's a picture of. It's called the cup of redemption in our in our Seder ceremony, which is mind-blowing because there's four cups, and it's the cup of redemption that the Lord pulled out and gave this completed meaning to. So, again, embrace them both. Fellowship whatever the Lord puts you comfortably, and realize both are honoring to the Lord in that way. Rowena? I'll get you, and then Clay, I'll come to you next. Rowena's been waving longer. <laughs> okay. Um, like, I want to testify that I am a Gentile who attends Shabbat service. It's not because I want to become a Jew or I want to embrace Judaism. 
is because I want to find in me a Jew who probably I could share the gospel with. And I don't, I know they're all over the place, but you can't really <laughs> know until they come into a Jewish service. And uh, that's where I can find them. That's why I go to a Shabbat service. But our God is faithful. Through all these um, Saturdays that I've been going to a Shabbat service, I have learned more and more about the Jewish people, like the festivals of the Jews. They are all a shadow of Christ. Who, where, who, our church will not teach all these um, festivals of the Jews. But when you attend the Shabbat service, they explain to you what everything stands for and everything points to Christ. So the richness in that Jewish um, time of worship, you're able to absorb it and it, you can apply it in your life to the point that I have loved Romans 11, 17, which means um, we Gentile believers have been grafted in. Now I feel I really don't need to be a Jew because once you're grafted in, you are already in Christ, just like the believing Jews are. I couldn't say it better. Beautiful, beautiful. And thank you, Rowena. That's excellent. And I'm glad you brought in the festivals, okay. too, that Rhonda asked about. Because, yes, I embrace the festivals as much as they are a picture of Messiah. Where I will separate from my Jewish not-believing brethren is with Yom Kippur, which is coming. Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement, and they're pleading for their atonement. I can't keep that one because I have my atonement. I can take that day and pray for my Jewish brethren that the eyes will be open and they'll yeah. see and they'll come to receive the atonement given in Yeshua's shed blood. But that is one that is a real sticky point. Um, just to make clear there are Messianic groups just like there are Christian churches all over the page. There are Messianic groups that will keep ritualistically and go through all the, you'll feel like you're just in the Jewish synagogue. Um, that's not who we are because we are constantly looking and embracing that fulfillment and bringing that out. I don't lose my Jewish traditions and my ethnicity, but again, I can't keep a day and plead for my salvation for 24 hours, 25 hours, and hope my name is written for another year when I know I have my atonement forever. And yes, yes, and that's actually a great point if we can get them there to come and to see instead of feeling that bondage and that weight and that concern and that fear, they get to embrace it. The burden's been lifted. Yeah. Yeshua's blood has covered it all. So um, we're off, and I'm going to let us stay off because it's not going to be time to go on. But when we come back next week, and then I'll get to, I've got to go to Clay and then to you. We will go in, and we'll start moving on past Genesis, but we'll go into Israel's history in the past, the different periods of time, and we'll see how God kept his promise through those times, how he showed them. It wasn't ever lost. It wasn't ever forgotten. We'll bring it into the present. We'll take it into the future. We'll look at that overall. So by the time we're done, we're not touching every single book, and we're not touching every single chapter because I'd never get done. But I'll give you that overview through the books that are in the, the time of the, the United Kingdom, the time when they're divided, the time when they're in exile, so forth. I'll give you that overall and show you how God kept that promise faithfully to Israel and how that is his time clock. And I'll take you all the way to Revelation, to the coming of Yeshua and God's plan beyond, uh, well, at the end, Revelation 20 and so forth. So we'll get that whole, forgive me, it is a part one and part two, but I think it's important enough for us to lay this background heavily. I really appreciate Rhonda's question. I open it up to this because there is a lot of, you know, and misunderstanding and expectations, etc., that come with that. That um, I've had dearly beloved believers call me the book of Galatians. You're Judaizing, you're taking them back to Judaism. And when I've encouraged them, come into one of our services, then see if that fits us. They would see it doesn't, but we need to make that clear. And at the same time, for my Jewish brethren that do feel the need to do more, as long as they're putting their faith in Yeshua for salvation, that's what matters, is, is that. So I don't have to divide from them 
um, in that sense, like that they are believing in, in Messiah for salvation. It's just I want to encourage them, embrace the whole picture and get yeah. see the whole. But when we understand the Jewish background, you all don't realize how much of the New Testament, the Brit is rooted in the original. That, that Paul used certain expressions. Yeshua Jesus spoke about certain specific things that if you don't have that Jewish mind, you don't understand it. You still understand everything you need. You, for, for salvation, you know, you have everything you need. It, it's like when I bring out the story, and I've got to hurry because I've got two people and we're running out of time. But when you study, the, and I brought out, you should Jesus being born in Bethlehem. When you start out and you tell a story, you've got the whole story. But if I start talking to you about um, the, the prophecies and Yosef and Miriam and uh, all that, that took place, it, maybe it's cutting through the red tape because I'm trying to think how to hurry. You all, and I'm not meaning to insult anyone, but the Gentile world has a gospel of black and white. Now, if you watch a black and white movie, you're good. You get the whole story. But if I come in with my Jewish background, all of a sudden, all this color yes, comes. And now you say, oh, I missed that detail. Oh, yeah. I get that connection. And that's the problem because you don't know that. You miss that. So when Yeshua Jesus is promising Israel the kingdom, how important that is. Why when you come in, and I don't mean you all, but the, the quote church that isn't getting it comes in and takes that off and takes that in a different direction and makes it all Gentile, they're missing it and they're 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 derailing. We're gonna see how God didn't derail, how God brings it all together. And as Rowena said, Romans eleven grafts in the Gentiles into the root, which is Yeshua, and you all will be a part. The church will be in the millennium, but they won't be earthbound. They're going to be ruling and reigning. Well heaven's our home. Earthbound is for the nation of Israel. So it, it's beautiful to, to, to see. <laughs> they, need to, well, they need to just... I'm so excited because I know there's so many things pertinent that I had to bring out today that fit right with what we're saying. So everybody, hold on to your memories. Skip a week ahead. Get through everything in your week and don't forget where we're at. Because you're going to say, oh, ding, ding, ding. All of these things are going to just come alive. And that's the perfect backdrop to bring you into God's time plan for the plan of the ages. Where you, when you see that separation of Israel and the church and see that there are different different groups and God has you know is working in different ways with them then as we look at this entire plan we'll go through and you'll be able to see how to divide the scriptures as the scripture says that we're to rightly divide the word of God is all for us for inspiration correction instruction and righteousness but we are to divide it then you'll know how to take the books and say oh I get it that book is talking to Israel. This book is talking to the called out assembly. Then you won't mix up the verses and get yourself confused in God's plan. You'll know where we are, where it all fits in, how it all comes together. And wow, what a plan. <laughs> Let me get Clay first and then you. Clay, I apologize. I get too wordy sometimes. Uh, Roger and Mute in the middle, Clay and um, Auntie Helen, I'll just call you, I'll adopt you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Clay. Actually, uh, Rachel, you kind of answered it, but I was just going to say, I don't recall in Scripture anywhere in, in the New Testament, you know, Jesus preaches repentance, but he doesn't, I don't recall where he preaches that the Israelites have to give up their traditions and their religion from the Old Testament. He does. Um, I don't see that, or I could be wrong, but no. I don't see that anyway no. in Scripture. You're, you're, so, yeah. Yes, you're right on target. And he came to fulfill the law. He came under the law, and he kept the law, and he came to fulfill the law. And the law was to point them to their need for a Messiah, to their need for the Savior. But no, he never tells them to walk away from who he made them and for, from his plan. You're, you're right on. You're right on. Loretta. Yes, uh, Sandy Week really opened up my eyes because she was a true a Jewish believer. Believer, and she made it tracks. Where yes. You would know how to speak to the Jews. Yes. So if you want some, I had some, and 
I sure. need to give it to somebody who wants to speak to a Jew. Yeah, because they, they are good, yes, yes. Yeah, and let me here. let me remind you all too, because this is how dear and precious you Gentiles are also. My dad, born into Orthodox Judaism, was brought to saving faith through the witness 12 and a half years of a Gentile <laughs> who knew how to talk to him and kept pointing him. And finally, the Lord um, miraculously used and opened my dad's eyes and he came to faith in, in his Messiah and Savior. So, you know, I stress it all the time because I hear, I hear both sides. I hear those who say, well, the Jews think they're you know, yeah, something, yeah. and I hear the other side where the <clears throat> Gentiles say, we're not. It's like, no, 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 we're all, we're all. God made us each uniquely beautiful and for a purpose, and Sorry. he loves equally, and he blesses us all through the one way, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And if they want to read the story, they can read the story. Yes, you can you can read his testimony tract. I can get it to you snail mail. You can go to the website and see it. You can hear it on our is it currently on our mm -hmm. okay, you can hear it, you can read it all kinds of ways. Um, I'm totally out of time. I don't mind it going on. I'm just gonna close and prayer for those who need to go and uh, we can, you know, have conversation till ends, but Sorry, I should have known I could not do this in a class. I, <laughs> someday I'll get smart and I'll quit saying I'll, we'll do it in one class. <laughs> but it does lay a great background to Daniel. Mm -hmm. And then when especially we get into the prophetic half of Daniel, it, when you're solid on this, you're going to see and understand so much more. And uh, really for my new ones too, let me just say any confusion that you have as to tribulation and where it fits and all of that, if you keep your verses to Israel and to the church in their proper um, order, mm -hmm. order, yeah, yes, where they belong, then that confusion is totally gone. You'll know you've got you've got God's plan. So, but our whole intent is to see it from the Word of God. I'll take you back to the Word of God again and again and again. Walk out the door and forget everything Rochelle said. Walk out the door and remember everything the Word of God declares. Yeah. So. Just make that real clear. Um, let me close in prayer and then I'll go for comments and questions. We'll just open up all the mics, okay? <sighs> Jehovah, you're Lord, our provider. We praise and we thank you, Yeshua Jesus. You are the God of salvation to the Jew, to the Gentile, and to the Jew -tile too. We thank you and we praise you for your perfect plan, amazing and amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Lord, thank you for saving us, Jew and Gentile, life through your shed blood. You gave it all. Oh, how can we ever, ever really express the depth of appreciation? Lord, know our hearts and now take us and mold us and make us more like you that we can in that way express our thankfulness to you for making us your child, your son or your daughter, belonging to you, joint heirs with you, grafted in or uh, as the original bit still brought in to the root, fed from the root, Yeshua Jesus. Praise you and thank you. We just stand in awe. And, and I'm silent. I can't say anymore, Lord. Thank you. We praise you. Bless all. Give them a good week as they go out in the richness of your word. Bless them and use them to your glory. In Yeshua Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I hope I got far enough that you all feel like you didn't just sit through a redundant class. Questions, comments?